I can't tell you how many times my daughter slammed the door. I'm literally off the hinge. Mom, stop it. I didn't grow up in India. I'm I'm much luckier than you. I get it. But like don't make me feel guilty about what you did not have. So anxiety and depression among our children have reached alarming levels. You cannot have kids and let them be raised by YouTube. You have to raise your kids, you, which means you have to be there present. Parenting is another full-time job, yes? It's the most full-time job. It's a full-life job. Dr. Shafali is a prominent figure in the field of psychology, celebrated for her innovative approach to parenting and family dynamics. Recognized by Oprah as a revolutionary thought leader, Dr. Shafali has significantly impacted the way we understand the parent-child relationship through her concise yet profound teachings. Children are pitted into the parent's movie, into their fantasy. And if they don't meet no. the fantasy, then they get fear, they get shame, they get guilt, they get control, they get punishment. Well, they need to stop thinking of teenagers as bad and be scared of them like you are, you are being. I'm so proud of my kids because they can see through the bullshit. I'm so proud of my kids because they are separating from me. That's healthy. It's healthy. They must separate, not to lose connection, but to find themselves. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shafali. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to speak to your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's go ahead and get started right now. So you played a pivotal role in popular, uh, popularizing the concept of conscious parenting. Your groundbreaking work in this area has garnered international recognition with high profile individuals like Oprah, of course, endorsing your revolutionary parenting approach. First question, what exactly is conscious parenting? So conscious parenting is a brand new, it's only been around since I wrote my first book, way of parenting our children that is drastically, like fundamentally different than the traditional parenting model that you and I were raised in. The traditional parenting model puts the parent in the superior dominant position where they give the parent full control and the mandate of that parent is to fix the kid, create the perfect kid, the happy kid, the successful kid, the extroverted kid, the cheerful kid. And the parent in that model is given this mandate and this burden and this responsibility, but also the delusion that they can actually create this magical supersonic creature who's a little bit of Julia Roberts, a little bit of Michael Phelps, a little bit of the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, Einstein, right? It really pumps the ego of that parent to say, here, you have supreme control, do what you want, fix this kid and make it a museum art piece. Conscious parenting realizes how ego-filled that is, how delusional that is, and how destructive that is. And that's why, you know, as a clinician, psychologist that I am, I work with adults and I see the ravages of that kind of upbringing where Children are pitted into the parent's movie, into their fantasy. And if they don't meet the fantasy, then they get fear, they get shame, they get guilt, they get control, they get punishment. There's a whole new way to parent. In conscious parenting, it is about parenting yourself. The parent has to parent themselves. Because when we parent ourselves, what that means is we're healing ourselves. 
we're coming whole and we're not going to use this child as an object of our fantasy. The child is not here to give us medals, to give us significance, to give us worth and to give us success. The child is here to live out its own mandate. And our goal as a conscious parent is to give the baton to the child. Here, you have to live your own mandate. It doesn't mean you don't have influence. You have a lot of influence. But the influence is not through control. The influence is through connection. That's incredible. And wow, what a great insight. Can you talk more about why traditional parental discipline is an absolute no-no and a little bit more about what parents should do instead? Yeah, so parents, of course, will resist this idea because we've been raised with that. So we think it's either full-on control, we get to do whatever we want, or the kids are going to be drug dealers and criminals, right? We, we cannot see the middle way because we were not raised with the middle way. So the pillars right. of connection before correction help you to enter into a deep bond with your children where your children don't see you as the ultimate ty tyrant and authority figure. Therefore, they're not fighting and rebelling against you. Therefore, they're more open to listening to you. And therefore, there's less conflict in the house because you're not the boss of them, so they can talk to you. And then you're like, oh, okay. So if you tell them to turn off the TV or the get off the video game, and they're like, no, you're like, okay, you want you you have to talk to me about this. So you can turn the TV off and go, I want you to turn it off. You don't want to turn it off. We have to both win over here. We both need to win. So let's come up with a strategy. Otherwise, I have to take the remote away. I don't want to take it away. So can you and I come up with a strategy? And if they say, you know, okay, 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 okay. You know, five more minutes or 15 more minutes, you make them write it down and sign, you know, and you take <laughs> some collateral. You're like, okay, I'm taking this, your favorite teddy bear till you agree. You know, you can make it a game about negotiation right. and partnership and connection and a, a, a mutual understanding, you know, create a memorandum of understanding over and over and over again so that you and your kid know that there has to be a proposal mm -hmm. and there has to be winning on both ends. So now my daughter's in her 20s and she comes to me, you know, and she'll say, okay, I have a proposal for you, right? She knows it's, that's how we talk. And when you're, and she says, yeah. when you're in a good mood, let's talk about it. And then she'll negotiate, you know, she'll negotiate how many friends can come over, how late they can stay up how much alcohol or not alcohol, like everything is negotiated and, and she gets some, she gets some credit and I get some credit and then we both lose a little bit too. But if you, if you right. build this in that it's a conversation, then the kid is not rebelling, sneaking, hiding, lying. She just needs, they just need to know that they need to present a good case and you need to present a good case. And you teach them that, Things can be negotiated. So it doesn't have to rise up to, I'm going to punish you because you're a bad, evil person. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Okay, um, let's move and talk about the teenage rebellion. <laughs> As a father, I sometimes lose my sleep, nervous about what is to come when my children will be uh, teenagers. We have so many dreaded stories from parents about their teens. And in your book, you talk about why teenage rebellion is everywhere. It's because our kids are fatigued by uh, their parents' gut complexes and burn out from being compliant and uh, obedient. Um, most parents don't actually even realize that teenage rebellion is a part of social development in order for them to develop and identify independent, uh, independence from their parents. So what can parents do to take uh, an immediate action and to do make this process easier? 
well, they need to stop thinking of teenagers as bad and be scared of them like you are, you are being. Because the reason why teenagers are scary to parents is because you really are losing control. Not only are you losing control, they have such an attitude and they tell you all your bullshit, right? They call you on your bullshit. Once they become teenagers, you cannot hide anymore. They are going to catch you. And they're going to find your hypocrisy. And they, if you raise them with empowerment, they're going to tell you about it. So that's why we don't like them. Because they're so annoying. They look right through you. But if you can look at that as a teaching, like, wow, I want to learn. I want someone to call me on my bullshit. I want to examine myself. I'm so proud of my kids because they can see through the bullshit. I'm so proud of my kids because they are separating from me. That's healthy. It's healthy. They must separate. When when parents tell me that, oh, my teenager is an angel, they are, they are so good. I go, uh-huh, wait, wait. Your, your teenager is just delayed. It is human <laughs> nature. It's human nature to want to separate, to individuate, not to lose connection, but to find themselves. And therefore, defiance in your teenage years is better then in their 20s, because then they may just, because they're not in your house then. At least when they're doing it in front yeah. of you, you can still stay physically and emotionally connected more than if they left the house. So if you can, as a parent, enjoy the rebellion and understand it's normal, it's healthy, it's necessary, it's effective, it's pivotal, then you're not threatened by it. And then you're not reacting to it. You are, you're laughing inwardly like, oh, here it comes. I can't tell you how many times my daughter slammed the door. I mean, literally off the hinge when she was a teenager because she had to show her, you know, her attitude. She had to show that she's the boss. Yeah. And I realized, oh, why does my kid need to show it so much? Must be because I'm being extra bossy. Maybe if I backed off, my kid wouldn't feel the need to yell and scream at me. So I learned from that. And the more I backed off, and just went back a little bit energetically and gave them space and negotiated with her and partnered with her rather than bossed over her, we had a much better relationship. Right. Now, that's that's incredible. And since we're talking about parental discipline, I want to make, bring up another really important topic. So anxiety and depression among our children have reached alarming levels. Our recent study revealed that the number of U.S. children from ages 3 to 17 di uh, with diagnosed with anxiety rose 29% from 2016 to 2020, and those diagnosed with depression rose by 27%. Two questions for you. Why do you believe this is happening? And what are some immediate actions that parents can take? So one reason why it's happening is because we're more aware. So it's being talked about more. So people are like, hi, me too. I'm anxious too. Hi, hi, hi. So on one level, it's very good, right? That we are picking up, catching and treating the symptoms. Another reason, uh, and this is my personal reason, uh, is because kids are more disconnected because they're more on social media and these apps that allow them to be constantly stimulated so they never get in touch with their presence or their boredom or just relaxing. Yeah. They're constantly stimulated. And then they are living in this hyper-realized, sexualized, idealistic, fake worlds. So of course, then you compare yourself and you're always looking lesser than because everyone's got something better. They're showing their fancy car or their fancy filters or their fancy homes. And you end up feeling lesser than because it's designed that way. So there's more of a comparison culture. But also, like I said uh, earlier, because we want our kids to be happy and all these apps are about dopamine highs and the algorithms are designed to raise your dopamine, you're also crashing and then you want the next fix and you cannot tolerate low dopamine in your body anymore. But when we were growing up, we were like just bored all the time. We were just leading average existences, just roaming around in the garden. But that was good for us because we tolerated not having dopamine hitting us all the time. And then you get addicted to that. Yeah. So talking about dopamine, this is a great transition into my next question. 
which is your generation, and, and I would also argue my generation as well, has created all of these technology apps that allow for extreme convenience, which brings up the issue of instant gratification. We can order food from our phones. We can order Uber from our phones. We can order groceries that literally get delivered within 15 minutes. I, ha I can order, actually, it takes seven minutes, not even 15 minutes. We binge watch Netflix shows because they release an entire season at, uh, at once. It looks like everything around us is truly designed to now give us instant gratification. Now, Dr. Shafali, how do I teach my future child who's born into this new generation the concept of delayed gratification? Because to me, delayed gratification is so critically important. And I attribute a lot of the success that I personally had or as a company to the concept or this, the, the idea of delayed gratification. How do parents instill that balance? Because now it's like 99% instant gratification. And I mean, delayed gratification is now out the window. I strongly recommend that parents do not give any social media apps, nothing to their kids till they're 14 or 15. Even YouTube needs to be supervised. Like YouTube is the new TV. So supervise your kids, be there with your kids. Do not leave them alone. Because it's not like a TV. Here it's constant streaming and constant entertainment. You can just keep clicking away. So when we used to watch TV, when, our, when we were young, the parent would say, okay, the show is over, done. But here there's no such thing as the show is over. So it's insatiable instant gratification. And that's not good for us because we are not pursuing anything. We're not waiting for anything. So nothing is amazing anymore right? There's virtual reality. You can go to Rome sitting in your home. You can go to Turkey sitting in your home now. So it's taken away the real life connection. So parents need to delay the gratification and delay it in their own lives and go back to one-on-one -on -one connection. And that's what this book teaches parents is the importance and value and how to of connecting directly one-on-one. -on -one. So parents are using social media as well, and they're distracted. And they're so happy because yeah. it's a babysitter. So the kids are missing out on connection, which is the cornerstone of conscious parenting. So parents have to do the work, right? You cannot have kids and let them be raised by YouTube. You have to raise your kids, you, which means you have to be there present and have eye contact and spend the time and play with them and invest your energy on them. And parents are so distracted today that they themselves can't do that. They have no attention to do that. Yep. Parenting is another full-time job, yes? It's the most full-time job. It's a full life job. There's no exactly. expiration date. They are here for life. You cannot return them. That's it. It's a, it's a life sentence, you know? So we don't realize that it takes a lot of energy to do it right. Now, it doesn't take yeah. a lot of energy to do it crappily because you can just put them in front of the screen. It takes a lot of energy to talk yeah. to them, to be available, to play games, to play with them, to imagine, to put them to sleep, to not use technology. It has to be real. It cannot be virtual. Question, and this is a famous question, probably one of the most Googled questions here is, at what age should I allow or give my child a smartphone? And you stated at the very minimum, 13 or 14 years old. Is that correct? At the very minimum. You can give them a phone. And you can watch YouTube or play games with them, supervised, like we did the TV, right? In the center of the house, yeah. no privacy, no isolation. Everybody watches, or at least you're passing in and out. Why do I say that? Because it's so addictive and so isolating. Your kid will disappear into the phone. The phone will eat your kid up. You'll never see your exactly. kid again. And it happened to me. But my kid was already 13 and she had a whole childhood without smartphones. So you need a kid who starts a smartphone and app usage at 14 is very different than a kid who starts at eight. So and 14 is also young. Yeah. So I'm just saying that because I know by then the kid will beat the parent up and lock them in the basement. So I'm like, give, give it, give it to them if you want to live. But at least till then. Yeah, it's 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 very easy to do when you're at a home school, but if you're doing public schooling or private schooling, when any other kid have phones and your child doesn't, this is gonna be crazy. You have to again explain to your child why this, why that. Yes, and you have to think of it 
or I think of it as a loaded gun. I'm not going to give you a loaded gun. It doesn't matter if everybody has it. You cannot, your brain cannot handle it. You could go into the dark side. You could lose yourself. It's too dangerous. When you realize how dangerous it is for developing minds, I'm not saying it's dangerous in and of itself. It just is not healthy for young minds to be prey to algorithms that are designed to create an addiction. And every social media app company says that they are algorithms. So I want to ask you one last question, because if I don't ask it to you, I'm going to get a lot of my friends and family that are disappointed. So I want to talk about something that's very common in our culture. So South Asians experience high rates of mental health issues due to intergenerational trauma. South Asian culture emphasizes family loyalty, self-sacrifice, and obedience. Our parents give up nearly everything they knew and left everyone that they were familiar with to pursue a better life for us, their children. That decision and their unconscious parenting have had a colossal impact on many South Asians, including myself. So how do we heal from this? And, and, and what can we do to improve our relationship with our parents? Well, you know, once you understand the culture that they were raised in, you can have compassion. My dad always tells me, you know, what did you expect from me? I was a product of my time, you know? And so there's nothing you can say because they are so conditioned because those cultures are so traditional that you have to forgive your parents. And anyway, being resentful is not going to change them. These South Asian parents are hardcore and they're not changing anytime <laughs> soon. So you have to make a choice if you want to stay in resentment or you want to reparent yourself and break the pattern. Like I was the first pattern disruptor in my family and I got a divorce, which is unheard of in my culture. My, my poor parents must be still, you know, shuddering in their sleep, but they don't, they don't tell me they're yeah. very proud of me, but I'm sure they're, they're, they weren't happy about it because of yeah. what culture says, not because of what they believe. So in cultures like that, yes. where the cultural pressure to look good and to be perfect is so much, that's really toxic for us kids because we feel obligated. We feel guilty. We feel like we owe our parents because they sacrifice, especially if they're immigrant parents. Right. I'm, a first, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. So my daughter's first generation. I also try to guilt trip her. All the time, I try it so hard. I'm like, oh, if you lived in India, you're so lucky. I didn't grow up like you. And if only you grew up like me. And she used to be like, mom, stop it. I didn't grow up in India. I'm, I'm much luckier than you. I get it. But like, don't make me feel guilty about what you did not have. And uh, so then I have to stand corrected. But I tried to guilt her too, like <laughs> my parents guilted me. But it's that immigrant mentality, right? I left my country for you. Yeah. But it's too much pressure on our children. We left our country because we wanted to leave our country. Exactly. So we need to own exactly. that. And now when we're in America, we cannot put our old values here. You know, that's, I don't yeah. know about you, Anayat, if you were raised as first generation where your parents tried to be yeah. Bangladeshi, but you're in America, you know? That's not fair. Exactly. So when I came to America, I made the decision that I couldn't go all Indian now. I left India. So I'm here. I need to get with the tide and understand that my kid is in, in America now. So I had to let go of a lot of my traditional beliefs and let her be, quote unquote, American. And uh, that helped her to find herself in this place. I'm not in India. You're, you're, you're not in Bangladesh. So it's not fair to ask our children to be connected to the country when we left the country, right? 